morning, West Side. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that. As you guys are coming in, I know some of y'all are coming in. So we're going to go ahead and get our hearts and our minds ready on this beautiful first Sunday of June. It's so exciting. Another month, another month of opportunities. Um, so I'm going to open us up in prayer and then we'll get started worshiping. Okay? Uh, dear God, thank you so much for this morning, uh, for the weather and the sun that's shining, that we just got a new day where we can reflect in you and we can just rejoice in your name. So help us, God, connect our hearts. We invite your spirit here this morning as we worship and um, I pray that we can just get close to you, God, today and worship together as a family. We pray this in your name. Amen.
pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord. Thank you for this amazing time of worship that, that we can be reminded by the truths of the words that we sing, Lord. We don't have to be afraid because you've conquered death and hell. Lord, you, you have made us positionally, you've justified us, made us right, called us your children when we come to you and, and we repent and we, we call out to you as Lord and Savior. Lord, may we live our lives, not only as a, as a church here at Westside, but may we live our lives individually as we go throughout our day with that victory in mind, Lord. We're, not, we're no longer slaves. We're no longer destined to go to hell because you paid the price for our sins, God. 
Lord, thank you for this time that we can get together. We can meet together. We can study your word and Bible study. We can worship together and fellowship and encourage one another. Lord, I pray that uh, as we come in today, that, that we'll be encouraged. We'll be uplifted uh, for the, the task and the day that we have before us this week, Lord. Prepare us today. Give us what we need uh, so that we can live for you the next six, seven days. Lord, we love you and just thank you for all you do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, worship team. Uh, just a couple of things here. If you're in the uh, middle aisle here, there should be a stack of connection cards. If you'll just grab one of those and pass it down. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor with us today, we just ask that you fill out that information there. If you're a regular tender or a member, all you need to do is put your name on that, and just uh, that's all you need to do. If you have a change of address or you have a new phone number or a new email address you want to give us, you can always put that as well in, in the um, offering plate. Keep that with you, and when the offering plate's passed at the end of the service, uh, you can uh, drop it in there. Some of you, uh, I've caught this question many times, Pastor John, why are we doing this every Sunday? Why do I have to fill out that card every Sunday? There's, there's a couple reasons for it. Uh, I want, number one, I want to tell you, there's a, there's a place there, those check boxes to respond. If, if you feel like the Lord's leading you to make a commitment, uh, check that appropriate box at the end of the service, and that's a way for you to communicate that. There's, there's other reasons there, but I just want to tell you, last week, we had somebody that checked the box that I prayed to receive Christ. Jamie, Jamie preached last week. So, you know, praise the Lord. We're following up on that, making sure that that's good. So, um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why we do that. So, but uh, if you're here, hopefully you got a bulletin when you came in as well. Um, I want, if you'll help me out real quick, we need to add one more name to the list here. I don't want this person not to be prayed for, okay? Um, Add the name Braulio to it. I'm going to help you spell it. Yeah, I'm going to help you spell it. So it's B-R, just, just take your pen out and write somewhere on there. Uh, add the name Braulio. It's B-R-A-U-L-I-O. So B-R-A-U-L-I-O. So if you will be praying for Braulio as well as these other students that are going to camp next week. At the end of the service, we're going to ask the students to come down here. And parents, if y'all want to come down and put your hands on your kids <laughs> and, pray, and pray for them. And I'm going to ask uh, Brother Devin to come lead us in a prayer at the end of the service for the students going to camp. But uh, that's their, uh, the bulletin has all the announcements. I'm not going to go over that with you now. But the most important thing, we say this every week, is that little tear-off section there. There's a place for you to leave prayer requests. I love to pray for you as a pastor. Uh, if I can pray for you about anything, take some time. Uh, before you leave this morning, write down any prayer request. You can mark it confidential, or if you want us to add it to the Wednesday night prayer uh, bulletin, we'll do that by just uh, checking the appropriate boxes there. So, All right. Well, I missed you guys last week. Uh, Zachary graduated, and we, were, we had to be out of town. But I, I want to thank Jamie and Devin both for uh, preaching the last two Sundays. But I'm raring to go this morning. So uh, as you can tell, like, did he have some extra caffeine or espresso shot or something? No, I'm just glad to be in the house of the Lord. I miss it when I'm not here. So but let's, let's stand up, uh, stretch our legs. Uh, if you haven't talked to somebody yet, maybe reach across the aisle, give them a high five, a hug, a handshake, and uh, we'll take a few minutes and greet one another, Lord, and then we'll come back in just a few minutes with our message. So.
still find your way back to your seats, or if you can't find your seat, just sit somewhere else. That's okay. <laughs> all right, all right. We uh, well, oop, almost did it again. I always jump ahead. Let me give you a couple of announcements real quick just before we go. Uh, you'll see these in the bulletin, so I won't go into real detail. Uh, about four or three, yeah, four weeks from today, we will be having worship in the park. I'm excited about that. We're going to be at Briscoe Park Sunday morning. It's, it's, I know it's June, so I wanna, first thing I'm going to tell you is come dressed appropriately. Your pastor will be in shorts and maybe like a polo, so don't feel like you got to throw a suit and a tie on or anything like that, but just come dressed comfortable. But we're going to have worship at Briscoe Park on the, the last month, uh, Sunday of the month here, so it'll be something fun. We'll do something a little different. Maybe we can interact with folks at the park, get them to maybe come in and join us, uh, do some worship and have uh, preaching there. Uh, that will start, uh, you see all that in the bulletin there, a little different schedule. We won't have a, a Bible study hour on that Sunday, but uh, so be aware of that. Also coming up in just uh, less than a week, well, it's about a week and a half now, is Juneteenth. Uh, we're going to celebrate, have our first celebration on Juneteenth on Wednesday night, June 19th. And this is going to be a, a really fun time to kind of celebrate and acknowledge the history of black Americans and the freedom that they enjoy. We've got inflatables coming. We have a coffee shop, I believe, that's bringing coffee coming. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, some other things, some fun stuff, food on the grill, hot dogs, hamburgers, all sorts of fun stuff. If y'all want to bring desserts to, to spike it out, have some great, uh, that sounds bad, don't spike it out. I, <laughs> I mean, sorry. <laughs> That's what happens when a dork says stuff off the cuff without thinking about it. You get weird stuff like that. But anyway, bring some yummy desserts. So um, uh, do that, and just we're going to have a great time. We've got a spoken word uh, message coming. Might even have, I don't know if we're doing music. We've got we to gotta sit down and talk some of these fine details here, but we're going to have a great time on that uh, Wednesday night. So, And then the last thing, uh, I mentioned this already, uh, at the end of the service, students, if you're going to camp, after we pass the offering plate, so this gets, it's not in the order here, but after we take up the offering, students, if y'all would just come down here at the front of the sanctuary if you're going to camp, and uh, we just want to pray over you uh, for the next week as you go. So, all right, well now we're finally, 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 finally back in the book of Acts. So if you remember last year, we started going through the book of Acts. We made it through chapter 14, and we kind of pushed the pause button once we got to Christmas and Thanksgiving, and we started do, doing some other things. So we're back. So we're going to be going through the book of Acts uh, each Sunday, kind of breaking down some of the different passages there. If, if you want to, if you had a notebook, maybe before you were, you were keeping up with that, break out the notebook or whatever. You can keep your notes in it there. But we'll be going through the book of Acts. I, I was excited um, while I was not preaching the last two Sundays. That gave me some time to kind of look ahead and kind of outline for the next like three or four months what each sermon will be. And I'm excited because there's some things I think that we'll all relate with, the, the church. Uh, you'll see this morning how they handled problems. Uh, we're going to look at Paul's mission trips uh, that he went through and the persecution that they faced as Christians. I think that's all really relevant for us today. We, we, we have a very similar time to this first century time when Christianity was growing and expanding and, and they were experiencing all these new things. I think it's going to connect with us a lot. So today we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. Um, what it's sometimes kind of con considered as the first church business meeting. Ooh, I know what you're thinking. All right, this is going to be exciting, right? Uh, sometimes church business meetings will either put you to sleep or it's like watching a WWF uh, Smackdown or something, right? It could be either way, right? You know, I, I'm, I sadly can say I, I have seen, not in this church, I've seen two church members, I've seen one church member shove somebody else in, in a business meeting, and I'm like, wow, that's, that's not us. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. But, you know, sometimes business meetings can be a little crazy. Um, but thank goodness we don't have that here. Knock on wood. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if y'all want to shove each other, no, 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 don't do that. Anyway, but we're going to look at, uh, at Acts 15 this morning. Um, how, how the church um, handled their business, if you will, so to speak. Their, um, the church was growing. You know, this is just a couple of decades after 
if not even that much, just a couple of years after Christ has resurrected and he's gone back to heaven. And the church is, is having a bunch of problems, but they're, they're kind of in the nature of their like, first problems. Like, well, we've never had to think about this before, so now what do we do? You know, because Christ came and he changed everything. The, the old law was gone away with and done away with, and Christ changed everything. I mean, it changed everything from the Jewish perspective. They, they worshiped on the Sabbath, and now, all of a sudden, they're, they're worshiping on the first day of the week. And, and the implications of the law, all these things were new. And so these first Christians are, like, figuring it out, right? They're like, okay, well, now what? Now that Jesus said this, what does that mean for this part of our lives, right? And, and so... I, I kind of want to think that as, as Christians here in 2024, there's a little bit of that going on too. All right, how do we deal with something new that, that comes along in our generation, in our time? How, how, do, we, how do we understand this? What should we do? Uh, you know, our, and we're going to talk about a little bit. You see the title this morning is The Business of the Church in a Diverse World, um, right? Uh, our nation, our 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 nation is very diverse now. Our, our county, I don't know if you know this or realize this, but our county is a very diverse county. Uh, I've said this before, but one out of every four persons that lives, that's a resident of Gwinnett County, was born outside the United States. Let that sink into you for just a minute. One out of every four, 25% of every person that lives in Gwinnett County was born outside the United States. So we live in a very diverse culture. And we'll see here, I think, in just a minute from the scripture uh, what the early church did and how they kind of worked through some things. And I, I hope and I pray that, that we will latch on to these uh, points this morning in the sermon, if you will, there. So, all right, well, if you have your Bible, if you will, turn to Acts uh, 15. Uh, if you can stand, if you're able to stand in honor of God's word, uh, I'd ask you to stand. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 21 here. It says, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch, and they were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers, to go up through to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made it all the brothers were, oh, excuse me, this news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and require to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows the heart and showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe uh, it is that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. Then the whole assembly became silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first showed his concern by talk, uh, taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent, his ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, uh, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that they have been known for ages. 
It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat strangled uh, of animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you. Um, on the back of your bulletin there is the outline, and I, I want to tell you this up front. We, uh, we are only going to get to the first two points today. I, as I was, uh, as I put this in the bulletin on Thursday, I had prepared to, to do all four points for this morning, and as I was finishing out my sermon, the Lord said, cut it in half. I said, okay. And, and um, I really felt impressed uh, to just break this sermon into to two halves. We're going to look at points one and two today. And next week, we're going to finish it with uh, point three and four. So, so hang on to that. We'll have a new outline for you next week and all that. But just want to tell you in advance, uh, I'm not going long on purpose. Uh, I, I plan this. So anyway, I know sometimes I do, but it's okay. Um, anyway, <laughs> so I want to share with you some things this morning as, as I read through this passage um, this past week, and, and the Lord just kind of showed things to me here. But if, if the business of the church in a diverse world, you know, we're going to see here from the Scripture, what, what should that mean for us today? So I think number one point there on your outline is this, that our business today, church, West Side, is to protect the unity of the church. Uh, you know, that's our business right there. Number one is to protect the unity of the church there. Uh, these men that came down uh, from Jerusalem, the, the scripture says there in the verse one and two, it says they were... Uh, believers, and they were telling these new believers, these new Gentile believers, this. They were saying, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Whoa! <laughs> okay. All right. Unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. So, verse 2 there says, Paul and Barnabas got this uh, strict dispute with them, this sharp debate with them. And like, oh, no, 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 brother. You know, and they start going back and forth. I wish I could have seen it. It was like the, a little bit crazy, like we were talking about a while ago. Maybe there was some shoving. I don't, I don't know. Maybe they're not. But uh, there's some on here. So verse 2, it says, So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see uh, the apostles and the elders about this question. What, what I want you to notice in this passage first this morning is this, that people stood up to do something about the, the division that was about to take place in the church. There was an opportunity for the church to be divided and to pick sides. <gasps> you know, no, no, no. This, these guys came in, and it's interesting, you'll learn in just a minute, they were from the party of the Pharisees. So praise the Lord that some of the Pharisees accepted Christ, amen, but there, these Pharisees were still struggling with their old tradition of following the law. And again, remember, they've never had to answer questions like this before. Well, what do we do about this? What, you know, so, some, so their old traditions were coming out, and, and they, were, they began to tell the people, unless you are circumcised, according to the law of Moses, you can't be saved. Ooh, dangerous. So all the leaders stood up and said, oh, wait, we're going to do something about this. We're going to protect the unity of our church. And you're saying this, and that's not right. So they, Paul and Barnabas started disputing with them and saying, no, 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 no. And, and what we see here, it was, it was individuals that stood up, but it was also the church as a whole. They, they, they appointed Paul and Barnabas and others to go back to Jerusalem to handle the issue. They're like, we, we got to solve this. We got to figure this out. And so they sent this delegation all the way back to Jerusalem. It's approximately about 250 miles. Would have taken probably about a month's travel to go from Antioch all the way back to Jerusalem there. That's, that's a good journey. But, but they were willing to do it and to take it and to, to do what needed to be done to protect the unity of the church there. And I hope we, we see that. Um, they, they go, they deal with it. Different leaders stand up. You, you saw Peter stands up. We're going to talk more about Peter next week and his learning and his transformation there and the things that he learned. And he even kind of went, went to it with Paul uh, even for a, a time. 
Uh, but Peter stood up, and James, the brother of Jesus, one of the leaders in the church here, they all went and they hashed out this disagreement that came up. You know, what's the right way? What, what do we do? What do we do with the law and, and all this? Uh, you see there, James comes up and he speaks. Look at verse 19 again. He says, James has, has spoken after Peter speaks. And there, James says this in verse 19. He says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles turning to God. James, you know, James is often known as the leader of the church in Jerusalem, right? We've, we've heard that. I, I had this thought this week. I got to wonder, was, was James a leader in the church in Jerusalem because he spoke up? In times like this, or was he was he already declared the leader, and that's why he stood up? I don't, you know. There's this mentality we're like, well, if you'll put me in this position of leadership, then I'll do this. I want to tell you, church, leaders lead whether or not they have a position or not. If you want to be a leader at Westside, or you want to be a leader in any kind of position at work or you know, uh, organization, you lead out by doing the right thing first. People recognize your leadership, and they'll put you where you need to be. And I just wonder, you know, we'll look at the timing of this. We're going to look at a little bit in, in Galatians chapter 1 next week with Peter and Paul and all this stuff. But was James a leader in the church because he stood up and because he opened his mouth and because he backed up the word of God and stood up for the Gentiles? I think so. I think that's, that's a good thing to look at. So what about us today, church? How are you and I protecting the unity of our church? How are we protecting the unity of the, the church, capital C, uh, uh, you know, all caps, all whole there? Or are, are we the ones dividing the church? It's, it's either... It's either or. I mean, we, we might can ride the fence on that, but think about that question. Are, are we, we're either protecting the unity of the church of God or we're either dividing it. There, there's one of two ways. What do you mean, Pastor John? What are you, what are you talking about exactly? Are we, are we defending the church from false doctrines that, that come outside? Uh, that's one way. You know, when, when false doctrines come in, do we say, hey, 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 that's not right. That's not what the Bible teaches. Do we, do we stand up? Do we defend the church that way? Uh, do, do we police our own people when they get out of line? When maybe they say something or do something that's not Christ-like? I, I think that's protecting the unity of the church. Um, uh, sometimes <laughs> I, I see stuff on social media that I'm like, man, why did that person post that? It's it's all truth, baby. Oh yeah, I, you know, I would, but there's zero grace and zero love in that. Should I not say, hey, I appreciate your fervor for this stance, but I want to encourage you to think about the tone in which you say the things that you say. I mean, there's a bunch of memes on social media that we can post, right? But is it helpful or does it hurt? You know, as, as Christians, we have to think and consider about not only the truth that we give people, but are we doing it in love? Are we just we don't care. We just want to shove truth down people's throats. If, if that's your attitude, I want to tell you, you're pushing people away. I would, and you say, well, it's the truth, Pastor John. But if, if we don't share it in love and, and with an attitude of desiring people to come and to receive forgiveness and to repent, it's not helping. And, and so, brothers and sisters, how, how are we protecting each other. How are we protecting the, the, the unity of the church here today? Um, or 
Are we being divisive? Are we trying to divide the church? And the one example, everybody, all right, everybody take a deep breath because I need it. <laughs> okay, I'm about to say something. It's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it, it's an election year, I know. But when somebody comes to Christ, do, do, we, do we ever say something like this? Well, now that you're a Christian, great. Now you need to vote like this. If, you don't, if, you're, if you're a real Christian, you will vote like this. Okay, and, and by the way, if you're thinking, oh, he's talking about the Republican thing. No, I'm not, I, I want to be an equal opportunity offender. I've heard both sides. I've heard, I've heard people who call themselves Christians, and they have told me to my face, Pastor John, I just don't see how anyone who can call themselves a Christian would not vote to help the poor. So there's the Democratic side of it right there. I want to tell you both, both of them are wrong. Okay? There's, there's a good, and there's a space for the discussion on that. And guess what? That's coming in the future. It's actually year. Devin and I have been talking. And like, we, we want to address this. And how should we as Christians vote? That, that is coming down the road at some point. We're going we're gonna to open up. We're going to rip the Band-Aid off and everything. But seriously, if, if we say, well, well, and some of you, you're probably going, I can't believe you say that, Patrick. You know, again, don't conflate the gospel message with how somebody might vote one way or the other. Those are completely separate. It's, it's an issue, church, of identity, right? Here's, here's the thing. It's an issue of identity. You know, if, if you go to a voting booth today, uh, you'll see a list of names, right? And usually beside those names, you'll see letters in parentheses, like R or D or I for independent, right? Go ahead, Katie, you can throw up the little graph there. Eee! Okay, right? Or we're in the month of June right now, so there's a lot of identity. People identify with LGBTQIA+, all that, right? And so this church is an issue of identity. Who do we, first and foremost, identify with? Is there, oh man, well, Pastor John, you're a Christian, but you're a, you're a MAGA or a Christian, or I don't know, I've been told that before, I'm a MAGA Christian. What? Oh, are you, have I ever told you who I voted for? Or what you, whatever, okay. You know, and people assume things, right? But people will say, well, this and that, 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 you know. We, church, we're not Republican, Democrat, LGBTQ, independent, whatever. As Christians, as people who have bent the knee to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we should put the big old, thank you, that was perfect timing, Katie, that was awesome. Yeah, right there, that was awesome, all right. We need to put the C by our name for Jesus Christ. He is the one that we identify with purposely, okay? Nothing else matters. There, there may be things way down the list of priorities, but Jesus Christ and the Word of God is how we make our decisions, right there. All right. And it is wrong. I just want to tell you this. It is wrong if, if we, well, now that you're a Christian, you have to do it this way. That's what the early, these Jewish Pharisees, this group of the Pharisees was doing. Oh, now that you've come to Christ, you got to get circumcised. you got to do this. No, 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 no. Church, we, we cannot do that today to the gospel. It is Christ and Christ alone. That is the only way to do it. All right. Everybody good? Everybody, okay. You can, if you really, if I upset you, please come tell me. You can, you can hit me later. I'll let you do it. If, if I promise it'll be okay. But um, I just, I want, you, I want us to all see that, you know. We, we can't add anything else to salvation. And, and that, that goes right into our, our next point right here. Uh, point number two is, is the business of the church in a diverse world is we have to clearly define the gospel, what it is, what, what it is not. We have to clearly define the gospel. So the, these leaders of the church came together. Paul and Barnabas traveled with others. Peter's there. James is there. They're, they're talking about it. Everybody's standing up, sharing their peace. These uh, group of the Pharisees that were apparently followers of Christ, they said their thing too. But one of the things they did, you see this in the passage here, is they clearly defined what the gospel is and what it is not. 
And they're like, okay, Pharisees, you said this, that you have to be circumcised. Jesus never said that. <laughs> you know, and they go back and then they hash it out. And you see there, look at verse 11. This is uh, James, excuse me, this is Peter talking after he finished his speech. He says, no, we believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. Amen. So he, they set the record straight there. You know, um, this reminded me of what Paul writes in probably one of the most quoted verses in, in the New Testament, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right? It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that this is not of yourselves, but is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. You know, God's free gift of eternal life is a grace gift. It is nothing that you and I can earn or work for to achieve salvation. And our, many people in the world think that, and, and they, they see this, and they, they think, well, oh, wait a minute, you know. Um, what was going on here in Acts 15 is legalism, right? Legalism. They, they were saying, oh, no, 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 no. You, you, you can be saved, Gentiles, but you got to do it our way. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the, the laws of Moses, too, like we have been doing for years and years and years and years, right? And then saying we have and we really haven't. But anyway, <laughs> um, but so, so legalism. What, what is legalism? There's a, there's a definition I kind of pulled a little bit from uh, off of a dictionary here. Legalism is strict adherence to observing laws, rules, regulations, which often focus on external behavior without a genuine heart change. It, also, it often leads to judgmental attitudes towards others. This is what was going on in Acts 15 here. Ooh, and I'm sure glad we don't have any legalism going on today. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, yeah, we might. We might. Yeah, we might. Um, yeah. Oh, man. I, do I need to ask everybody to take another breath again? <laughs> okay. Um, here, I'm not picking on anybody. Uh, I really, when I try to think of these things, I just, you know, do we, do we, do we make salvation? Do we make becoming a Christian, you have to do it my way. That, is that, that's the legalism thing, you know. Now that you're a Christian, your, your colored hair, your tattoos, your whatever, you, know, you, you should stop doing that. You, you got to change. Don't, you, do it our way. Okay. Or now that you're a Christian, um, may, maybe you need to think about maybe not ever kissing your girlfriend again until after you're married. <laughs> the, the purity culture stuff, right? You know, what? Okay. You know, that, these are all examples of maybe uh, legalism that, that we might consider, you know. Or, or now that you're a Christian, and we're glad you're saved, but now you have to behave this certain way. You have to do, you have to observe this holiday or this special thing just like we always do here, you know. And so there's all sorts of examples of, of legalism. I was trying to think of different thoughts with that. Um, you can go back again to, to the voting thing. Now that you're, now you're, you have to vote this way or, or uh, stuff like that. All these could be great examples of legalism. Paul in uh, Colossians chapter 2 gave, gave us some good wisdom about legalism here. I just want to read these verses. This is uh, Colossians 2, uh, verses 20 through 23. He says, Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why? As though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with, a, with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul, Paul was trying to help the church there in Colossae that they were struggling too. Oh, man, we, we're, we, we feel like we've got to go back to the law of Moses and do it this way. And Paul's like, why are you going back? You've been set free. Why do you want to return back to the law that, that, that has trapped you there? And again, I, I don't know. I want to be very careful about trying to name specific things in which we could be Legalistic. There, there's a million, I'm sure, that we can think of. Um, but I just want to ask you this. You know, look, look in your life today. This is your homework this week. Is, is there anything in my life 
that I've kind of set up as a, as a golden calf or something in my life that maybe it's something I'm convicted of, but maybe I shouldn't be trying to push that on everybody else. Maybe that, that's fine if we want to live out our personal convictions, but maybe, maybe there's one or more ways to look at something, and, and maybe I shouldn't try to be as, as forceful in pushing that uh, on somebody else. One thing I, I noticed since we brought in Myanmar Baptist Church and Song of Psalms into the sanctuary, and I've, and I've come to several of their worship services, they do things differently than we do at Westside. They, they have different worship services. They involve different people, and they, they pull children up on stage, and they have people that come and share testimonies. I'm like, what if I were to say, wait, you can't do it like that. We don't do it like that at Westside. You know, who, who am I to say something like that? They're, they're from a, a completely different background. They've got a different education, and, and so there's got to be some understanding there. And, and it's okay if you are convicted to do something or not do something, that's great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's got to be my way for everybody else, too, right? So we have to really uh, prayerfully consider that. All right, how many of you have heard of the uh, Barman Declaration? Anybody at all? I didn't think so. <laughs> Anybody here? The Barman Declaration? Okay, well, this, this occurred 90 years ago as of Friday, May 31st, 1934. What is the Barman Declaration, Pastor John? <laughs> okay, this was a declaration that was set in Barman, Germany, the year after the Nazi Party came into uh, power in Germany, when Hitler came in, all right? Uh, what's so significant about the Barman Declaration that I've never heard of before, Pastor John? Well, here, here's a little something. Here's, here's a thought to, to give you. The, the Barman Declaration, the, the words, I'm going to read a few of the, the declarations here. They're not all that complicated. They're, I mean, they're like, we, they're like, okay, I agree with that. But here, here's the thing. <laughs> uh, the Barman Declaration was put together because it was a response to the Nazi Party coming into power. The Nazi Party in Germany in 1933 and 1934 began to demand that all the churches submit to their authority and do what they said was okay to do. And if we started to round up people and to do things, that's okay. You have to go along with it. And if you speak up against it, then you're not part of us. And so there was a group of pastors that came together, uh, those like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and uh, let's see if I can remember some of the other ones right off the top of my head, Martin Niemöller, Karl Barth, all these pastors there that lived in Germany and they got together and they drafted what's, what's called the Barman Declaration. And, and here's what the Barman Declaration says. The, it says, the only source of revelation is the Word of God, Jesus Christ. Any other possible sources, earthly powers, for example, will not be accepted. Jesus Christ is the only Lord of all aspects of personal life. There should be no other authority. Again, this is speaking to the authority. The message and order of the church should not be influenced by current political convictions. The church should not be ruled by a leader or a fuhrer. There is no hierarchy in the church except Jesus Christ. And, and it goes on and on and on. So you see, what they said is, that's not controversial. We know Christ is the head of the church, right? But church, it, it was the time in which this was written that made it bold because when these men drafted this and they signed their names to it, you know what it meant? It, it, meant, it meant death. It, it meant for some of these men, they were imprisoned. It, it meant for some of these men, they were tortured. They were taken away from their families. And for those like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, ultimately, he gave his life. He died in prison um, for his, and, and this was really the document that became, in Germany in this time, it became known as the Confessing Church. There, there were two, two sides to the church in Germany. There was the, the liberal church that sided with Hitler and the Nazi party, and then there was the Confessing Church that said, you're not our authority, God is. We're not going to do what you said. And, and so I bring this whole illustration up with you today to, to say this. Church, we need to be courageous like these pastors and these leaders of the church in Germany were, when it comes to defending the gospel for what it is, 
There, there's a lot out in the world today that says, oh, no, 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 no. Well, the gospel, you have to earn it. You've got to work it. You have to do this and this, and you've got to add works to it. You, you've got to fight. And you've got to post on social media these things, or you have to fight for this or that. And then, then you can be a true Christian. No, we, we, have to, we have to be willing. To, now, true Christians will do things. We will fight for what the Bible speaks of, but it's not the gospel plus that. And, and God, God, especially in our time, I love that new Jeremy Kemp song, For Such a Time as This. Have y'all heard that? It's great. Man, it's like speaks to me. We, we need to have that same kind of attitude right now in the environment we're in, in the culture we're in. Some might say it's a pre, uh, precursor to some kind of a new way in the, in the United States. We've got to have the courage, church, to stand on what the gospel is and say, this is what the church is for. This is what it's not for. And, and to be willing to boldly proclaim that. Um, I'm almost done here. We're going to land this plane. Um, you know, I, I think the best way to clearly define the gospel is found in God's word, right? Uh, you can go to 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul tells us right there what the gospel is, right? And so do we know, are we confident that we know what the gospel is, that we, that we can defend it? And I think the best way to clearly remind people what the gospel is, is for us to share it. You know, the, the more I use something, the more confident I become with it, right? If, if I'm learning a presentation that I'm presenting at work, or if you're presenting something, I don't present presentations, I preach. But anyway, if you're presenting something, right, if you become more familiar with the material, the more comfortable you will be with Presenting that, students, you, you got to do something in school, right? You have a presentation, you got to stand up in college or in the classroom, right? The more you're familiar with your material, the better you'll be at presenting it. It's, it's the same way with the gospel, church. If we understand it, we know what it is, what it's not, and, and if we just practice sharing it, we'll become better at it. We, you know, we're having our last apologetics Bible study tonight. If you want, I hope you'll be here at 6 o'clock if you want to come. We're going to continue to talk about ethical issues and how we use apologetics in a lot of different areas. But you know, I, I've had people tell me, well, Pastor John, you're really good at apologetics. Well, okay, whatever. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm a mediocre person. But, anyway, but I, I want to tell them the same, well, okay, you can be great at apologetics too. You just have to use it more. You've got to practice it. You've got to share it. And you have to be willing to say, you know what, I might say the wrong thing and get laughed at, you know, or I might say something and I don't know how to respond back. That's okay. It's, it's a learning curve. But the more you and I share the gospel, the more we become familiar with it, the, the better we'll be with it. And so I just want to encourage you this morning, uh, get into God's word, know what the gospel is. And then secondly, get out in the world and share the gospel as often as, as we have opportunities. I know the opportunities are getting smaller. People don't want to hear it. But do we take, do we take advantage of every opportunity that God gives us to share the gospel? Um, earlier, uh, I said something about the identity, right? It's, it's all about our identity. Who do we identify with? Republican, Democrat, Independent, all that stuff. Um, are, are you here this morning? You're, you're here in church and you're ready to identify with Jesus Christ this morning. Are, do you want to choose to, to, to love and to, to, to call Jesus your Savior today? All right. maybe, maybe you grew up in church. You know a lot of churchy things. You know things about the Bible. But maybe you've never personally chose, chosen to follow Christ, to have a personal relationship, to walk with the Lord. Are you, are you ready to do that this morning? Are you ready to put your identity in Christ? Uh, I want to help you with that. Uh, we love to use a gospel acronym. Uh, if you want to put that up there, Katie or Ava, this just these six phrases here, but you know, it uses this acronym gospel. God created us to be with him. All the way back in Genesis 1, we see God created the universe, but he also created Adam and Eve, and he wanted to have a relationship with them. But then... The next chapter comes. Chapter 3 in Genesis, sin enters the picture. It's our sins separate us from God. 
God gave them one prohibition, do not eat from this tree, and they did it. And if you and I were there, we would have done the same thing too. <laughs> I'm pretty confident of that. All right? But our sins separates us from God. God had to remove Adam and Eve from their presence. Uh, and, and we see that in Genesis chapter 3. Well, from Genesis chapter 4 to Malachi chapter 4, the last chapter in the Old Testament, we see the next thing. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Uh, the Old Testament is filled with these sacrifices that had to be made by the people to atone for their sins. And it, it just covered them over. And, and they were over and over again. Imagine the amount of sacrifices that had to be done to atone for their sins. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. We, I can't do five good things and, and five bad things and say, okay, I'm equal. It doesn't work that way. The Bible says it's not of works so that no one can boast. Uh, next one there, paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Uh, God knew that we could never atone. We could never work for salvation. So that's why he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. Uh, the next statement there says, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. It's not Jesus plus coming to church. It's not Jesus plus putting a tithe in the offering plate. It's not Jesus plus being a good person. It's, it's Jesus alone. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Uh, the, the Gospel of John uses the word belief 98 times. It's only used about 47 times in the rest of the New Testament. The Gospel of John is all about believing in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that he died for your sins, paid the price on the cross for you? And, and the last letter there, life begins now and lasts forever. My, my favorite verse is John 10, 10 uh, says that Jesus said, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give life and more abundant. God wants to give you eternal life, but church, he wants to give you an abundant life right now. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to, to receive joy and peace and, and all that in your life. You don't. Uh, and if that makes sense to you, if, if you understand that, those six points, uh, I just want to help you. If, if today's the day that you want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, I just would ask everybody by your heads, nobody getting up, nobody walking out, please. Uh, if you're here this morning and you, and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, would you, uh, I'm, I'm going to say a prayer and I'll, I'm going to break it into little phrases. If that's your desire this morning, would you repeat this prayer after I do and, and just whisper it quietly or say it to yourself? Uh, say something like this to God. Say, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you love me. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Today, God, I'm coming to you. I want you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to place my faith and trust in you. Give me that eternal life and abundant life now. Thank you for coming to my life. In Jesus' name, amen. In a, in a minute, we're going to have our invitation time, and we're going to sing a song. I want to challenge you. If, if you prayed that prayer today, and you asked Christ to come into your life, would you come down here and just shake my hand and say, hey, Pastor John, I, I prayed that prayer. Maybe, maybe it was today. Maybe it was a year ago, a month ago. And, but maybe you've never publicly made that decision to trust Christ or, or to be baptized. I, I'll, we'll just talk, and I just want to help you in your next steps as a new follower of Christ, okay? Um, that's, I'm not going to make you make any speeches or anything, I promise. It's easy. But uh, Christians, some of you have already made that decision. You've already trusted Christ a long time ago, many, many years ago. Where are you at? Are, are you ready to protect the unity of the church? Are we, are we going to stand up? Are we going to be willing to, to police each other and to help one another and, and to do the right things there? Uh, are, are, are we going to clearly proclaim the gospel? Do we understand it for ourselves so that we can pro you know, clearly proclaim it? Where are we at this morning? Maybe the Lord's put something on your heart. I just, if you need to come down, the altar's here. You can pray at the steps. I, I'll be glad to pray with you if you'd like me to pray with you. I'll be glad to do that. Um, 
You're welcome to, to deal with the Lord right, right where you're at in the pews there this morning. Uh, maybe you feel like Westside is, is the place that you need to call your church home. Maybe you don't, you're not a member here. We want to invite you to be a, a member at Westside. You know, membership is, is we're, we're here for each other. Membership has accountability and responsibility. We're here to help one another, to, to work through the, the things that we go through. But if, if that is, you believe that God's calling you to, to, to join the West Side, we'd be glad to have you. So come on down. If the Lord's speaking to you this morning, let me, let me pray a quick prayer, and then we'll have our, our, our song. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, Lord, this is your time to work in our lives. Lord, challenge us. Help us to, to see where our identity truly lies. And maybe if it's in something else, or we've put something else before our relationship with Christ, Lord, help us to change it. Maybe, maybe we've put a political party in front of you. Maybe we've put our the color of our skin before you, God. Maybe whatever it might be, God, help us to put you first. Lord, this is your time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand. pray that that will be the, uh, those words, will be the song of our heart this week, Lord. I love you, Lord. And because I love you most and first, that dictates how I live my life. That dictates how I talk, how I act, how I post on social media, everything, Lord, that I want to reflect the, the Christ-like character, Christ-like words, uh, because I love you, God. Lord, now as, as we come, we give our tithes and offerings to you, Lord. I, I pray that uh, you'll take the gifts that are given this morning and use it for your glory, your kingdom. Lord, we're thankful for every penny. We, we can say, oh, we're a little behind in the budget this year. That's okay. We're, we're thankful, Lord, for what you have given us. And we're trusting you and knowing that, that you will meet our needs, God, because you're God. Uh, Lord, we love you and we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat there. Just a couple of announcements while they're passing the offering plate. Students, uh, don't go anywhere. Get ready to come down here. We're going to pray for you. Uh, tonight's the last apologetics class, 6 o'clock. Um, let me grab my bulletin so I'm not missing anything. But uh, mentioned Juneteenth already, the worship in the park. Vacation Bible School will be here soon. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's a... Uh, centrifuge students, if uh, once the offering is passed, if, if you guys would just come down here and uh, 
gather. If you're heading to Centrifuge, if you can just step down here. We want to pray, pray for you, pray over you. And uh, if you would remember uh, church, pray for them. They'll they'll be sweating it out, going pretty much all day long for uh, Monday through Saturday, and uh, working working real hard, studying the Bible real good. And, uh, this is just a select. There's you can see on the bulletin. There's 13. Uh, total students going, two adults. But uh, just keep them in your prayer. Keep Ask God to keep them safe, keep them hydrated, <laughs> nobody falling out. Uh, but uh, And then also just help them to receive from the Lord what they want to do. But uh, Devin, would you come? And... Okay, great, great. Eternal Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time that we're able to gather before you. We know in your word it says you inhabit the praises of your people. God, I'm also reminded, God, that there's a special place in your kingdom, God, in kingdom business for young people to be about your business and your business alone. Lord God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal uh, himself to the students throughout this week, God, in ways that they could grow into your likeness. God, praying for some salvations, Lord, praying for some spiritual transformation, praying for uh, strongholds removed, God, praying for greater obedience to your will, God, praying for strength and peace that surpasses all understanding, praying for traveling mercies, God, to and fro, praying for the parents, God, that they would have peace and relief while their children are out focusing on the Lord and aiming to grow in his likeness. God, I pray that we would all have the spirit of boldness and the, the fervor to pursue your ways and your will, God. We know that this Christian journey is just a, not a 100-meter dash, God, but it's a marathon. We are pressing on to the prize of the high calling, Lord. God, I pray that you would give the students boldness to chase after you and to run after you. God, rid any relationships or hindrances that get in the way that may entangle them from seeing your ways, God. God, I pray that you would give them hope and God, allow them to see that you're their only hope and security. Things may fail, the grass may wither, God, but the word of God forever stands. Lord, we love you and praise you. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Christ's name, amen. amen.